Hello, everyone. And welcome for the final time <laughs> to the Caddick Pavilion at COP15. And thank you for joining us today for our final presentation. You'll also be hearing that this is the last time I say I'm Lauren Small, the director of the Canada Pavilion. Bonjour à tous. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue au Pavillon du Canada à la COP15. Et merci de vous joindre à nous aujourd'hui. Je m'appelle Lauren Small. Je suis la directrice du Pavillon du Canada pour l'environnement changement climatique Canada. I want to mention that the Laurentian University is located on the traditional territory of the Atimekesheng, Anishinaabe, including the traditional lands of the Wanapete First Nation. We're also today um, on the unceded territory of the Ganye Gahaga in Dojage, Montreal. First, a few housekeeping items. If you would please turn your cell, cell phones to mute, it would be very much appreciated. Donc, si vous mettez vos téléphones cellulaires sur Sourdine, ça serait apprécié. Cette session sera enregistrée. This session will be recorded. C'est avec plaisir que je vous présente notre, de notre dernier événement du Pavillon du Canada. De pire au meilleur, la Sion globale de l'histoire de la restauration de Sudbury, organisée par l'Université Laurentian. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our final event at the Canada Pavilion. Worst to best, Global Lessons from the Sudbury Restoration Story, hosted by Laurentian University. This event will be hosted by Dr. John Gunn. Dr. Gunn holds the Canada Research Chair in Stressed Aquatic Systems at Laurentian University and has led the aquatic restoration work in Sudbury, Ontario for the past 40 years. Sudbury was the world's largest point source of sulfur dioxide pollution and has made a remarkable 98% emission reduction-based recovery. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gunn. Thank you, and I, I do hope that uh, uh, this last opportunity is a great opportunity to share uh, one of the great global success stories with this conference on such a prestigious day, a day where uh, just a few hours in the middle of the night, these uh, historic agreements came together to uh, protect biodiversity across the world. And I hope this example that I'm sharing with you now can uh, encourage people that it's possible. I show an image uh, beside me of then and now, and that's when I, on the then, was when I first arrived in Sudbury. And uh, <clears throat> it was such a notorious place that the word Sudbury was synonymous with pollution, that other whole countries considered Sudbury a unit of pollution equal to two million tons of sulfur dioxide. So at conferences, they would encounter me with how many Sudburys is your country? And uh, I was shocked to think our hometown was an, a name as a unit of pollution. And I'm trying to convince you today, after those many years, that it deserves to be considered a unit of restoration. It was also an extremely contentious place in a transboundary battle between the United States and Canada. And that, too, was solved only by addressing this particular point source. So Sudbury was then and, and is now uh, a huge change, and I will go through uh, some of the lessons that we learned in Sudbury in hope that other countries and communities can benefit from those lessons. The community itself and the culture of the community was badly damaged by this situation. It was mocked as a moonscape. Uh, the astronauts actually carried out geology studies there because of its meteorite origins. And I'll show you a little bit of those stories. But first of all, Sudbury was on the stage 30 years ago. I don't know what date it would be, but the first uh, signing of the, the Biodiversity Convention was at the Earth Summit. And Morris Strong was the executive uh, uh, director or secretary. And he awarded Sudbury on that particular day with the Local Honors Award for the early work that they were doing in restoration. And uh, I'm going to show you that we haven't been lazy. We've been working in the last 30 years to do uh, many more things. 
It was also a huge uh, argument between Canada and the United States. This gigantic point source of pollution, the satellite images could see the plumes crossing the American border, extending all the way to Mexico, occasionally going off to Greenland, the largest point source on Earth, and you don't get to negotiate with your neighbors when they can point at the problem. And so all of the lobbying and negotiations through the 80s was for naught until Canada uh, agreed that we will not shut down our, our, our industry, but we will impose firm and fair legislation and at the first stage, a 50% reduction in that pollution. And there are the two conservative uh, politicians of the day. Uh, George Bush Sr. and Brian Mulroney of Canada in 1991 signing uh, the Acid Rain Treaty between Canada and the U.S. And a big part of that treaty was the agreement that our type of damage zones would be, uh, would be dealt with. For those in the audience that may not know the, the story or the location, Sudbury is uh, about 600 kilometers to the west of us here in Montreal. It's uh, on the edge of the Canadian Shield, which is a massive area of lakes and rocks. Much of our water is on the Canadian Shield. Much of our mining is on the Canadian Shield. And Sudbury is right at the, uh, the boundary of the Canadian Shield, but it's also very close to the American border, about 200 kilometers. And that's where the uh, discussions were focused. And we view this now as a model system where others may, we hope, learn from it. We'd love to have visitors come and see the, day, the change and recognize this as a model system for the UN decade as we proceed. So to see the, the past, it's always good to see the, uh, the background. This was Sudbury. Uh, as a community back in the 1800s. It's a continuous mining site, one of the largest mining complexes on earth. And it was a very destructive time uh, in the 1880s when it first opened and into the 1900s. Uh, extreme destructive air pollution and land damages. But what is it today? Today, it's a community of 160,000 people that the students and I are proud to call home. It was recently voted one of the happiest communities in Ontario. It has uh, some of the cleanest air quality in all of Ontario. And it has a thriving industry that will be the basis of much of the uh, green economy into the future. Tesla just signed major contracts to get metals for batteries from Sudbury uh, under the restricted conditions of, of the, um, the mining sector there. So how can a thriving industry survive and generate a clean environment where uh, the fish have returned? I'm a fishery biologist by trade, so I'll throw in some fish stories for you as we go along. But I'd, I'd like to make the case that clean air and investments in the environment help revitalize communities in ways we never imagined. We never really imagined the Nobel Prize in physics would be won in Sudbury, in the mines of the neutrino labs. But that causation, correlation, I would say there's causation that professionals want to live in clean, clean communities and conduct research and raise their families. We have one of the, the biggest film festivals in Canada, next to Vancouver and Montreal and Toronto. It's in Sudbury. Uh, we have a thriving science center in Sudbury. Could this possibly happen in the 80s when intolerable air quality was happening? Not likely. So I'll go back to tell you the, the full story. It, it happened 1.8 billion years ago. Sudbury was hit by a meteorite uh, that created the second largest crater on Earth that uh, mineralized the landscape 
and in the edges of the massive crater was created the great treasure trove of Sudbury. Two massive ore deposits on Earth, one in Siberia called Norilsk and one in Sudbury are probably the largest uh, uh, ore bodies that still exist and have been continuously mined for 120 years. There's today what the crater looks like. It was a 200 kilometer crater and here's the, the famous Sudbury Basin. The largest crater on Earth is the Dome Crater in South Africa. But this crater is now quite flattened by millions and millions of years of glaciers and erosion. But if you look in the center, you can still see the shape of the original crater. And that round lake is a second crater. Twice at the same location of Earth, we were hit by a meteorite. <laughs> Might be a third one coming any day now. <laughs> but that one is a, a flash of the, in the pan 65 million years ago, that uh, Wanabate Lake. And that's the home area of the Wanabate First Nations that I'll be mentioning. They live on the edge of that round, beautiful lake. This was the source of the wealth and has always been the source of the wealth, but also the source of the problem. Copper and nickel ore buried in a sulfate deposit where the sulfur levels in the ore are so high that it's almost combustible. So any industry that has too much energy to waste creates product pollutions and damages. And when we had the energy built right into the ore, we were very wasteful in the early days. Because this was the technology of the day, is to tear down the forest, use it as a fire pit, pour the ore on top, fire pits that were seven kilometers long, 11 of them across Sudbury, light it on fire and burn the, the earth. And those were smoldering landscapes that went for months at a time, rolling out over the landscape, the smell of sulfur like the match in your nose, just rolling and, and burning everything in its, in its track. And we proudly raised production to the point that we were the largest source of sulfur on Earth. Just to put that in context, at the height we were 2.5 million tons. That's twice of all of industrial Europe today. It's about a third of China today. We were doing it in several small smokestacks at the turn at, uh, when I moved to Sudbury. My wife didn't want to stay. I don't, we lived out of town the first few years. And here's what we faced. A landscape in the center of the zone that was leached with acid, was sulfuric acid, had lost a meter of soil, was burned right to the bedrock with uh, sulfuric acid. And the remnants of the ancient pine forest are there and you can see how much soil would have been lost to have such giant trees of the day. About 80,000 hectares of that barren, that's the size of the island of Hong Kong, reduced to that, that condition. But that wasn't the problem, and that wasn't the problem that created the, 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 the protests by the public. The long-range transport of that pollutant was destroying the wilderness areas the beautiful parks. This is the magnificent Killarney Park landscape. That's not snow, that's white quartzite. And the famous group of seven, Canada's favorite artists painted there. And the acid rain from Sudbury poured down on that area and killed the fish and, killed the, and burnt the trees. And then people were outraged. So to see what the Sudbury footprint looks like, this is the Sudbury footprint where in the center is the, is the extreme damage zone even around the three major smelter zones today and then reaching out to the large deposition zone where lakes and streams and forests were damaged. Now to put that in scale, that's 17,000 square kilometers. That's bigger than 40 countries that signed the agreement last night. That's the size of our, our uh, footprint. 
and it's the size three to five times the size of PEI, our largest province in Canada. That's our study site, and that's the Sudbury damage zone that I'd like to report on today, what dramatic changes have happened. Within that damage zone were 7,000 acidified lakes, and that became the focus of my research, my aquatic team, but the, uh, I'm here representing the broad sweep of researchers Hundreds of researchers have come to Sudbury from all over the world, and I'll try to fairly represent everyone's work today. First of all, we had to deal with the pollution. There was no remedial work to do. There was no need, there was no right reason to go treating the water or lakes until we could deal with the pollution. Oddly enough, during the, the Copenhagen meeting, when Scandinavia was complaining about Germany and the UK polluting them at a distance with smelters and tall smokestacks, we proudly in Sudbury opened the tallest smokestack on earth that same year. If the mayor had only known when he cut the ribbon that the resolution, I think it's resolution 18, says thou shalt not build tall smokestacks to pollute your neighbor across borders and we built the tallest on earth to do just that. That has been now completely decommissioned and nothing comes out of the super stack anymore. And that was by science and public work like we, we experienced tonight. So this is an image the whole world should have in their back pocket or on their cell phones, is the record of Sudbury pollution reduction under control orders and carefully administered government legislation. I'll just show you an animation of that, where pollution has gone. Down to 2% today of the height in 1960, when we were at our peak at 2.5 million tons. But as I visit other countries, the industry still thrived and still thrives today. The land was so badly damaged that the community couldn't hold its professionals. The image of the city was so badly damaged that people got together and said, we have to repair the damage at the same time we're reducing the pollution. And Government and NGOs and volunteers came together over all these years. 4,000 paid workers, probably not accurate numbers, at least 13,000 volunteers, many working continuously over these decades. Carrying fer lime and fertilizer back up onto the hillsides, treating those, those landscapes, planting 10 million trees, Jane Goodall, the Prime Minister, and our minister came to celebrate the 10 million tree this year in Sudbury. That was what triggered this invitation today. And uh, we're very proud to respond. I'll just show you a neighborhood and the sequence of change that happens in a neighborhood you might have lived in in Sudbury. So your neighborhood in 1980 would look like this. 85, it would look like that. 90, it looks like that. 95, 2000, the trees are back. Air quality is back. So the first, the first lesson I, I take from this, and we'll, we'll try to produce a policy paper afterwards in facets, leadership. Leadership at all levels in the community were essential. Here's the leader of the land reclamation. He grew up in, in your, the UK, did his PhD in, in the in industrial areas of the UK, brought that technology and, and worked to Sudbury. And Peter has been working 40, more than 40 years, continually leading the community regreening program. So if you're facing a challenge, you have to find a champion, you have to find a leader. And we've been fortunate in across the different sectors to have various leaders that have stayed with the project through 
all the financial and government changes that have happened. Where are we today in, in the work that Peter and the regreening people do? This is the inner zone, that damaged zone. They have, covered, they have restored the landscape in up to 50% of the suitable planted areas today. Those 10 million trees and uh, many more naturally colonizing trees. And so far we estimate that we've, through the tree planting alone, have sequestered 650,000 tons of carbon in that forest, which was a barren, basically a parking lot before. And uh, if you take the additional work that the industry has done, at least a million tons of carbon has been accumulated in the, in the land as, as the restoration work continues. Here for the Biodiversity Conference, Peter provided some numbers of what species have returned to those, this, these areas. He estimates greater than 250 species of vascular plants greater than 20 species of mosses, 50 of lichens, mammals and birds. And there's the iconic uh, peregrine falcon that uh, was brought back to a reproducing population in the area through uh, community nesting efforts and, and release programs. And there's a whole ev evolution of uh, naturalist clubs and bird watching clubs that would never have existed. <laughs> before that have come to really treasure this landscape now. From on the aquatic front, and I'm just showing lakes within the city of Sudbury in the, in the very inner zone, we've been monitoring the lakes since 1970. And the acidic lakes are now almost gone. pH 6 is where we'd like to get all of our lakes back. Wavy Lake is, that's an older graph. We just got it above six now. But all the inner zone lakes we study have made it to the pH six threshold. And the other pollutant was the dust in the smelter. Thousands of tons of copper particulates, nickel. Other uh, potentially toxic metals were raining down. People's cars were damaged. It was a dust storms. These are valuable commodities that were being thrown out of the smokestack and turned into waste and a problem. And we'll deal with that became the focus to restoration is get rid of waste and turn it back into a commodity because uh, that's what you're in the business for. <laughs> so you can see nickel levels, for instance. Sudbury was the largest, was the nickel capital of the world. And uh, at the turn of last century, 90% of the nickel production on earth uh, came from Sudbury. Where do you think the nickel batteries are going to come from in the future? Uh, and I hope they come from recycling the waste piles and turning waste into batteries. That'll be one of the projects I'll show you. The aquatic biodiversity in the local area and then across the giant footprint has also responded. Vast numbers of fish species were lost, lots of aquatic life of all sorts. And up in the top corner is a beautiful red and blue fish. That's an I iconic fish in Canada, uh, identified by World Wildlife Fund and the work was supported by them, the Aurora Trout. And aurora trout uh, refers to the aurora borealis, the northern lights. And you can see from its colors why we named the fish after the northern lights. It only existed in two lakes in the world, in the middle of that fume zone. And those lakes were, uh, those populations were destroyed in the 50s, but the managers got there in time to rescue the population, bring it into captive breeding, and those fish were returned uh, in the 90s to a restored lake and today that species has, has been delisted on the endangered species list. Yeah, that one deserves a clap too. <laughs> it's still in a fish sanctuary. You just, you can't go fish, fishing for an endangered species, <laughs> but you can go and admire it. And uh, the other one at the bit bottom is the uh, the lake trout or the lake char 
is kind of symbolic of Canada's clean, cold lakes of the north. It's, kind of, it's a species that, that uh, evolved and lived through the glaciers. It needs cold water. And 50% of the damaged lake trout lakes are back and restored to reproduction as well now. More than a half a million fish were originally stocked and as the lake started to improve, but now they're migrating and self-colonizing the water themselves. But, it's all, but the world is changing at the same time. Other species that are more invading the area because of climate change and roads and other development doesn't mean that we're going to get back what we had. We're going to, it's going to be a different world, and unfortunately, uh, climate will change it considerably. So we can see for, in this graph that the lake trout abundances decline uh, by about 75% in the presence of these warm water species and roads and such, but it still persists and will probably still persist for, forever, for a long time under the future climates. But like our forests, we're going to be dealing with a different kind of forest uh, when we rebuild. So I gave you one lesson. That was leadership. So what would the other lessons we learned from Sudbury, what might they be? Well, the first is legislation and regulations. You need good government. You need firm and fair legislation. And in the industry today, you know, tell us that there's a lot of environmentalists hidden in industry. <laughs> the manager, a lot of them are my old students that are working in those organizations. And they need firm, fair legislation. And that's what was provided there. Was the regulations were applied, for instance, you must achieve 50% reduction or we'll shut you down. But you have a number of years to do it, and we're not going to impose the how on you. You can use any technology, anything you want. And then more importantly, everyone's going to be treated the same. Your company, your competitors' companies, we're going to be firm but fair. And these companies have thrived under that. This is one of the companies in Sudbury, uh, Glencore. They shared this image with me for the conference. You can see that in the shaded area, they've met their emissions reductions, they've stayed under the line, but look where their nickel production has gone up. They've actually increased the amount of nickel they're producing out of a cleaner and cleaner company. That's not what we were told when we were kids working, <laughs> fighting the battles. They said it was a, the companies would collapse, they would leave town, there was no, there was no solution. You don't leave the second largest ore body on earth very easily. <laughs> and they didn't go away. What they did was they invested billions of dollars. I don't know the exact numbers. It's at least $3 billion in retrofitting, rebuilding, preparing for the future, and looking for efficiencies and benefits for themselves. When the engineers are told you have to do it, it's your turn to come to the boardroom table with an answer. We're no longer in the, in the search and fine metals world. We're in, we've got to meet a regulation, and those innovation teams get moved up and get paid attention to. And what they did was focus on their core business. What do we produce in this company? We produce metals. We actually produce a vast amount of saleable acid, sulfuric acid, liquid for the fertilizer industry. So why are we throwing our, our product away as a pollutant? Why don't we shut down the loss of metals out of the smokestack and sell it? Why don't we shut down the loss of sulfur and turn it into a saleable uh, liquid sulfuric acid? And why would we waste so much expensive diesel fuel and energy, fossil fuels, in running an inefficient process? And at the same time, why can't we get greater productivity out of our workers with modernization and robotics? And the picture you're seeing was snapped a few days ago, a few weeks ago. 
This is the modern operation. You're looking at what 2% looks like. Those are the generations of abandoned smelters in the middle of a, a modernized company. And uh, those old smokestacks are slowly being torn down. But that's an amazing picture of what a company that has 2% pollution looks like. And it's thriving. The next lesson is Fine, make it a big tent. Everybody's your friend. Everybody can contribute. Broad-based partnerships of all sorts. We didn't spend time on blame. The industry was welcome to the table. The, the legislators were welcome to the table. Volunteers, NGOs, everybody found a project they can contribute to in restoring this landscape. And that was, and that was a, a theme that the city leaders carried forward is partnership, 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 and be flexible. You don't know where the next dollar to run the program will come from. And you have to be able to jump from one source of funding to another and remain flexible. For instance, they involved the school programs and gave the schools the competition. They had, what were the 50 ugliest schoolyards <laughs> could we get? Could your school win the ugly school award and convert it into something beautiful? And an industry CEO loves to turn up at a school and give out a check to the kids that uh, improve their schoolyards. So the ugly schoolyard program has been going on for decades uh, to uh, make the urban environment pleasant for kids. One project I'm here to represent today is the Wanapate First Nations. Within that large landscape around uh, uh, the footprint are various traditional territories. And one of them is proposing to uh, create an, an indigenous-led conservation area around the last old growth green fo uh, pine forest in Canada. And uh, I hope you'll see their proposals in the near future. But uh, we're in full support of the, uh, the idea of having indigenous-led conservation areas within the Sudbury footprint. And it'll provide young people within those communities with jobs and ecotourism and an opportunity to sustain those landscapes. There's a video out on the screens that describes that in detail. <clears throat> The other one is science. Use your universities, use your college people, use your consulting firms, and learn as you go. Teaching, uh, learn how to do restoration by doing it. Try different things. We had such severe landscape. The temperatures in the black landscape would reach 70 degrees in the summer. You could not walk in this landscape. The drought conditions were so severe. Uh, the toxic metals were, were nasty there. So you had to do different trials of different species, of genetic forms of plants, different treatments, and learning as we go and adapting what we called the Sudbury recipe uh, in each stage of the development. The next was everybody works in their little silo. The land people don't talk to the water people. <laughs> Uh, the tree people don't talk with the animal people. Uh, viewing things in a connected way is watershed treatments. All of a sudden, the people working in water and monitoring things like the chemistry of water were surprised that lakes were changing very rapidly. Well, that's because the land people were up treating the soil and lime and fertilizer were benefiting the entire watershed. So as time got on, we held a party and everybody started to work together. We designed the reclamation in a watershed basis. So you'd get a double benefit of the land would treat the water at the same time. And then as time went on, we realized that in the rush to get things done, like many countries in the world are doing, monocultures, plantations, uh, we wanted to grow trees as fast as we could and cover the land with trees. 
but those weren't sustainable forests. The old design were these plantations uh, of trees, but we, what we need to bring back is living forests that support each other and can sustain them. So here we brought in a whole diversity of plants, sometimes transplanting things that were being destroyed elsewhere. When highways would go through, the kids would gather up the plants and move them to the uh, plantation areas. And slowly, th the mindset changed. We're not going to design trees. We're going to create forests in all their functions. So the Sudbury recipe, that's the chef there with his knife, <laughs> uh, is constantly changing. Is what species do you add? What order and procedure do you add? And how do you prepare for climate change? What species would not grow here now, but will be growing here in 20, 30 years from now? And that's the sort of recipe that they're developing and sharing with other countries uh, at, the, at the moment. I come from a research background, and I want to emphasize the role of basic science and research and modeling. Bring your academics into the world as well. And here's a work that was conducted through a colleague at Cambridge University in the UK. What he discovered is although the area of Sudbury is warming like everywhere else, planting trees was slowing the wind down so much that it allowed the lakes to cool in a period of warming. And that the organics, the color, the tea that comes out of forests, protects the lakes from the warming. So strangely enough, the computer model when tested against the lakes was true. You can protect for our lakes for a period anyway as the climate warming and actually get colder lakes in warmer climates to the point that the famous lake trout that can only live in cold water, the first time in 50 years we were able to have a, cold, a, a lake trout live in the downtown area was recently uh, identified and, and that's the first one we caught. So Andrew Tanizak is now in Canada and we've welcomed him back to a Canada research chair at Trent and I thank him for his contributions. And I'm just going to show a couple other people that uh, have been doing really interesting things. This picture you're looking at is the vast waste fields around the smelters of 100 years. Areas of three to 4,000 hectares of sulfur wastes from the mines and mills. But in that waste, as you can see, is seven to eight billion dollars of residual nickel. Why would you build another nickel mine when you have a waste pile that already has vast amounts of nickel in it? And Nadia Mikachuk is developing bacteria that can leach uh, the nickel out of the, ore, out of the waste, bring it back into solution, and use it to make batteries. That actually is a process that uses CO2 from the atmosphere, not very much but it doesn't generate any other waste uh, to speak of. So frequently used in South American countries and others called bioleaching, and not often done in northern areas because of temperature limitations, but we're slowly developing technologies that can mine, and we call it bacterial mining. We create bacteria consortiums that will mine for us. You may wonder what that red color is. You may think it must be lava or something flowing out of there. That is life in its abundance. That is bacteria looking for an alternate energy source in the form of an iron bond, oxidizing iron. And look, every organism is looking for energy. And that, if you put your eyes to it in another way, is the blossoming of life uh, happening there. And that's the sort of bacteria that liberate the copper and nickel and other things. Here's an earth science person that's thinking that where did the, what do we do with the loss of soil? We lost a meter and a half of soil. Where do you get soil? Well, in this case, we might have to make the soil. And can we use other companies' waste 
to make our soil. Instead of their waste going to landfill, can we bring the waste of various companies together, pulp and paper waste, wood ash, paper sludge, and a vast amount of biosolids from municipal sewage systems. And here they're combining those wastes and Graham is standing on a, a waste soil that is growing a, uh, a biofuel corn crop on, to on top of one of the nastiest tailing sites in, in Sudbury. It also protects uh, the uh, tailings from oxygen. It's an oxygen barrier that keeps them from oxidizing and releasing their acid. So it serves many purposes. Or if you can't do anything with the land, use it to produce power. So some of the pits are being converted into solar farms rather than destroy agricultural land. And similarly, highway lands that are destroying new areas, they're harvesting the vegetation and the soil from those and using them in treatment. So using the idea of repurposing waste, there isn't, with eight billion people in the world, there is no extra land. And we can't leave land in a wasted state in the future. Here's a fantastic thing, uh, bio, microbial bioremedia or uh, biodiversity. The invisible life that began us all, we all became, I believe, we all began as bacteria <laughs> on Earth three or four billion years ago. Uh, it's amazing the bacterial richness in the industrial landscapes. Can we put that industrial biodiversity to work? And Drusa has found that some of the bacteria and algae growing there can be processed for pharmaceuticals and very promising evidence that uh, breast cancer cells are effectively treated with some of the pharmaceuticals taken from industrial mine sites. Uh, amazing stuff that I, I love to see them when they present that. So that's an example that basic science is needed all the time you're supporting your restoration work because there's things that they bring to the table that uh, are needed. The seventh of eight lessons is monitoring and reporting. You can't go to court, you can't do anything without defensible data. And you need credible labs, and you need to be able to defend your data, the methods. And so we put a big effort into monitoring the legislation, making sure that the industry knows that somebody is tracking the environment to show that those investments are worthwhile. And here, I think, is the longest monitoring uh, site in the world for acid rain. It's the Clearwater Lake site set aside in Sudbury that Environment Canada and many others use in, in the references. But here in the presence in a forested area, no liming, no treatment, simply clean air applied to the landscape. A pH 4.5 lake rises to its natural lake pH of 6.5 over a 30 year period. Fantastic news that what we call the irreversible damage is not so, that there is a solution that nature can heal. So do not give up on a piece of property saying it can't be ever treated. Clearwater Lake look, shows that all you did was insist on clean air in that landscape. Reporting and thousands of papers have been written about Sudbury and books and special issues. You have to, your obligation as scientists is publish your work and get it out there and defend that work. And then hold major conferences and we've had uh, seven to date I think of mining and the environment and uh, hope to hold another one in the near future that brings the world together, especially for field sites that people want to go out and see these things and take their own measurements. Those are important to bring the nations to sites where they can go home and show that I've been to a place where it actually works. And then make that information available online uh, for educational purposes. And any that wish, there's a full credit course program of all the aspects of bioenvironmental remediation from Sudbury. 
It's released in three languages, in French and Spanish and English. And uh, it's available to, uh, uh, to uh, exchange this information for, in, for students to get uh, training or credits or for staff at industry to take uh, upgrading courses using that uh, method. The final one is uh, doing what we're doing today, is celebrate, is tell the story. And it's am amazing the way that people celebrate this in, in Sudbury, through art and poetry and painting and kids' things of all sorts, sculpture. But there's, a grand, there's an awful lot of uh, community-based celebration that goes on as kids are involved in the restoration work and take credit for it. And now former mayors were children at one time who did the original work. They take credit for it when they run for office, <laughs> that I was a kid on those hills carrying the bags and I actually did all the work. So it's, uh, you need to do that. And we've been honored by some of the great celebrities of the world coming to Sudbury to uh, celebrate this. And this is the UN Ambassador of Peace, Dr. Jane Goodall, who was with us this summer. And Jane, uh, I actually get to uh, perform in the play, in the movie with her. <laughs> She's uh, such a, an advocate for this site. She's come five times, takes the children out to teach them about hope. And she's releasing a, an IMAX film called uh, Reasons for Hope. It'll come out in July. And here's Jane with my students and me uh, releasing a fish. She's holding it like a baby chimp chimpanzee. That's the way she handles all fish, it's like they're chimpanzees. And she kisses them and names them and lets them go into the lake. And over to the other side is Jane with the indigenous students, indigenous children. And she's with them releasing fish uh, 30 years after their parents released, uh, did the same things years ago. Jane is 88 years old and uh, she's uh, tirelessly working for the environment. And I think we all uh, owe her uh, a great gratitude. So. I could cover the screen with acknowledgement logos of all sorts, but just to quickly illustrate that there's a vast array of agencies, funding agencies, partners that contribute to this success. So today, in the last talk at COP15, uh, on the day that the biodiversity uh, agreement was reached, uh, very pleased to bring a, a story that was on stage 30 years ago when the uh, Biodiversity Convention was first drafted. And I, I think uh, this example shows that uh, everybody should have hope in their area as well with the uh, convention we signed uh, last night. So thank you very much. And <clears throat> I haven't got anywhere to go, so if anybody has any questions. <laughs> Anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? You just come up to the microphone and we can record the question. Sure, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I just had a quick question about um, sort of the export of some of these lessons learned to the Canadian international impact, because obviously there's lots of Canadian-owned companies that have a massive impact on minings globally. So I think it'd be interesting to see how you're trying to sort of impact these lessons in places where the legislation there's, is less firm and the, the impact is much higher on biodiversity. That's very true. Is Canada is a, a mining country and has uh, operations all over the world. And uh, at, at my level, at my academic level, I, I speak frequently to their CEOs, meet with their uh, executive directors, and encourage them to uh, uh, not violate rules in other countries that they may, uh, to follow the examples they exercise in Canada. And, and I, I hope that is, uh, is affecting those particular countries, but you'd, 
the whole issue is to hold their feet to the fire and, and make sure they, they do do that, that they don't take uh, the wealth of other countries at the cost of those countries. So uh, that's, uh, I'm sure, one of the issues that were discussed throughout these two weeks is uh, uh, developing countries shouldn't uh, be the source of metals for the electrification of the world at the damage to their environment. So please work with us and encourage those com companies to do the right thing uh, out of country. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Matt Munson. I'm a uh, band member of Dene La First Nation. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to congratulate you on, on your life's work. This is absolutely amazing to hear. At, uh, research Center. <laughs> right. Well, well-timed, uh, <laughs> given the events of today and, and this week. Um, so my, my question is, um, so <clears throat> now that we have this global agreement on biodiversity, and I know there's still work to do, and it's, it's not uh, probably perfect, um, I'm wondering um, uh, just this kind of local, regional uh, uh, work that you've, you've put together with your partners and allies, um, do you feel like uh, that having a, a, a global uh, agreement uh, and perhaps even a global network, uh, perhaps uh, even a community of global practice, uh, do you feel like uh, instances like this that probably are happening elsewhere uh, but maybe just haven't had the, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the global scope uh, to bring out these projects and the learnings and, and understandings and, and hopefully uh, perhaps uh, uh, apply them uh, everywhere and, and have information uh, coming from uh, all over the place locally. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, what, a, what an important question because my two student leaders are with me here today that will uh, help some of this happen. And we were sitting in our room thinking, how do we go home and encourage more work to be done because of this conference? If you can recall the Sudbury footprint, 17,000 square kilometers, bigger than 40 countries that signed the agreement. Since 1960, 22% of that area has been put in parks and reserves. Uh, we're going to go home and ask for at least 8% 8 more. If we can't exercise that 30% in our own footprint country, the Sudbury country, uh, this one of the projects that we mentioned was the indigenous uh, innovation or in, uh, led conservation areas. They need to go on. They need to expand. And those areas will add to that. And we can use the example of the 30 by 30 in our own local landscape and insist that this isn't work to be done in far off remote areas. We have to add another 8% to the Sudbury landscape. And uh, I actually just sent an email back yesterday to our parks people saying, where can we find another 8% <laughs> so that we're in the, uh, and, uh, and how much will the indigenous claims uh, help us get there? So you're right, uh, we have to act local uh, to impact global or uh, we're just talking in the wind otherwise. But thank you for that question, and we'll try to do our best. <laughs> thank you very much. My name is Mr. Josue Aruna. I'm uh, from Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm working as a part of civil society, uh, defending environment and the climate change and biodiversity conservation. Thank you for your presentation. I know today that uh, in Canada, you are very organized on conservation issue, but also on land restoration. We are uh, experiencing with mining company in DRC, specifically some company from Canada and the other from China, the organizer of this event. They do not respect the right of commun local community and indigenous people when they come to, to do mining. And uh, last time, two, two, three years ago, we were fighting against the exploitation of mining 
inside the protected area with a Canadian company. I think that uh, this day is for us a good day because to get great collaboration with people who could help us to, 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 to get the voice from the, 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 the ground and to talk with your government uh, yeah, here because my country, we have mineral, we have many, many resources, but to, 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 to look, to go to do mining inside the protected area, and also to do not respect the right of local community and indigenous people, this could not allow us all, at locally, nationally, but globally, to at to, to reach the 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 the, 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 the outcome of this um, GBV, yeah. Uh, and the, the second the second way is to know. I I, I see here this is the great realization on re, uh, land restoration program. How could do you engage directly with civil society? Because. The one way we are we, we are facing uh, uh, this is the challenge things that after negotiation it is between the states, but the civil society and the local community and the indigenous people are working daily on the ground without any mechanism of financing support, maybe. Collabor direct collaboration with civil society in, 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 uh, on the ground. I think we can't now save the, our world without acting, really action on the ground with civil society and the local community. I think that I would like to know how you are expecting to engage directly, directly with civil society uh, this, I think, that it could be better. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I agree, and and uh, and this talk is recorded that way. Is that uh, industry shouldn't be violating uh, the rules and regulations they apply in their home country uh, anywhere else, and their actions have to benefit the local people. Uh, if they're exploiting the local people at, to their profit margin, that's wrong. And in our uh, examples, the, uh, uh, it's been a long battle to try to get uh, working relationships between industry and, and local communities. The industries, there's many, many vehicles of uh, taxes and regulations and support it's it's easier in a in a stable government situation where you're putting uh, pressure on companies uh, in those settings, and uh, that's uh, that's why I good government is uh, one of the important and an engaged public that asks for support and are given support uh, is really important in the battles we share. But uh, it's not to say that. A place like Sudbury over the last 150 years has had many, many hardships and uh, civil strikes and demonstrations and court cases and uh, those are all important things to do. Um, but with these major agreements, I hope the world now changes, those companies change, uh, those governments change. To, uh, to the benefit of uh, the environment and the local people. So uh, I, I, I can only offer you a, a hopeful example of some of the two of the mine, biggest mining companies in the world. And if they can do it in Sudbury, they should be able to do it in the Congo. Uh, well done. Hey, thank you for a lovely audience. I uh, was worried that we would be short today, but it's a very uh, much much appreciated. So thank you. So if uh, I could just ask you, just ask you to uh, 
indulge me for a few minutes. I appreciate your presentation, Dr. Gunn, and I think it's a great way to wrap up um, this Convention on Biological Diversity because it inspires and, and adds hope, and thank you for your life's work on this. It's very much appreciated. Um, and I, you know, I talked about when we opened up the Canada Pavilion that it takes a village, and it really does. And um, everyone has a COP15 story, and my story is that I was, I was asked um, by ECCC from Parks Canada if I would be interested in working on the Canada Pavilion for COP15. I don't think it took me more than a few seconds to say absolutely yes. Um, it's really a, um, one of the high points of, of 25 years, almost 26 years of public service. Um, and I want to recognize some people in this room today who without um, their support, their vision, their creativity, this would have never happened. So my core team, um, Heather, Veronique, and Sarah, if you could please stand. And give them a round of applause, please. Um, and if I could get Rachel, Irene, and Corey to stand. Um, we did over 100 hours of programming for the last two and a half weeks. And if it wasn't without these three core individuals, not everybody is here. I also want to recognize Claudia David, who's not in our room today, and a number of other people who are not here today. Um, it was because of the process that we put in place for the call for proposals that we ended up with this rich um, program over the course of the last two and a half weeks. And I also want to recognize Leah Canning, who's in this room. Leah, stand up. Because if it hadn't been for Leah, none of you would actually be able to be in the pavilion. Um, and there's other people in our delegation, if you want to stand up too, and part of the Candel. Um, these are people who were negotiating and helping with the high-level segments that you didn't see because there's a lot of people in, who are in the background. And I also want to recognize three individuals, actually a fourth, and I don't know where he went. But this, all the AV that went on for all of these presentations back to back to back, over 100 hours, how can we help you? Requests that came at the last minute. Je suis tellement fier. Qu'on avait TKNL, donc JP, Simon et Marc, qui sont en arrière. Donc, on apprécie beaucoup euh, votre support dans les derniers de, deux semaines et demie. Et honnêtement, c'est tr les trois personnes en arrière qui a, qui a livré pour ce cup, um, without having anyone replace them for the, the whole two and a half weeks. So, I'm super grateful for that. And um, I hope when you all go back, to wherever it is that you will go back, to whatever position that you're in, just remember that you were part of a historical moment, a really important historical moment in terms of biodiversity. So, you know, I think we're all leaving our hearts here, and um, we learned a lot about it through our traditional knowledge that it's not only here, but it's also here. So I leave it, you know, in, in the way that um, our Indigenous people who have been guardians of this land since time immemorial to please remember that as, as we move forward. So thank you, and, um, and merci beaucoup, and enjoy the rest of your time in Montreal, and thank you so much for your support.